looks like the last item we uh, need here is the stir and the H2 and O2 at their convenience. Okay. Thirteen, we've got one more item for you when you get a chance. We'd like you to uh, stir up your cryo tank. In addition, uh, I have a shaft and trunnion. Okay. For a look at the common Senate if you need it. Okay. Stand by. Okay, uh, we've had a problem here. We got more of a problem. Okay, listen, listen, you guys. We've lost uh, fuel cell one and then new pressure. Oh, here's the way we've had a problem. Stand by, they got a problem. Main B bus undervolt. Roger, main B undervolt. Stand by, 13, we're looking at it. going through my mind is we're a long ways from home. We were hit with something we didn't expect. We were hit with something that we just our wildest imagination all or what if thinking they never expected. That damn room was in serious confusion. And it, it took me a while to come to that conclusion, but it was true. And I'm not sure that Mission Control knew what to do at that point. I says, Chris, we're in deep shit. We were still trying to grasp the total scope of this problem. One of our fuel cells had died, and the second one's dying. And from a standpoint of everything we had, you know, that's not a possibility. I mean, that's not a survivable situation, yet the crew's surviving. But the key thing to me was time. We needed time to think. We needed to pull this team together doing something that had never been done before. Tim Peak, as you work your way around the mass caster there, feel free to look at the load pads and get some situational awareness. When I'm trying to about. describe to somebody what I do for a living, I always have to ask, have you ever seen the movie Apollo 13? You know, that big room where all the people sit, that's, that's where I sit, that's what I do. When you describe your job, they ask, what do you do at NASA? And I said, I'm a flight director. And they look at me kind of quizzically, and I say, you know, the guy with the vest and the buzz cut, I uh, have had a chance to meet a few of those guys. I, I really admire everything that they stand for and what they were able to achieve. I think it's kind of amazing that um, out of nothing, they built this great institution. Okay, understand that. In the ventilation, in the middle, we wouldn't be here today without the achievements that, that those folks made and the strides that they took in getting us down the path of human spaceflight. Yeah, where we'll leave you there. Okay. 
The people that have worked at NASA and particularly the folks in the Apollo era make it a point to come and speak to us to make sure that we truly understand the job that we are getting ready to undertake and uh, share their experiences with us. So all of us are very grateful to our founding fathers. I grew up in both Oklahoma and Texas, and I used to sit outside at night and I'd gaze at the moon. Never occurred to me that we would land people there. I still go out and I like to enjoy gazing at the moon, but I don't look at it the same way I did when I was growing up. It's a different moon to me now. My childhood was directed by my father, who was a drunk, and he was a uh, womanizer, and he uh, was a gambler. I left Philadelphia, where we ended up living, when I turned 18. I said, I've had it. I'm getting out of this hell hole, and I joined the Army. And they made me a weatherman, <laughs> of all things. When I was a senior in high school, I guess, I took an aptitude test and it said that I should either be a funeral director or an engineer. And so I went to the library and checked out a book titled What Engineers Do. And it, it really intrigued me and I said, that's what I want to be. I want to, I want to be an engineer. I was uh, born in a little town in Pennsylvania, coal mining town. My dad worked in the coal mines for a while. But Growing up, I was really fascinated with airplanes. So I built a lot of model airplanes and I hung them from the ceilings, little balsa things, learned how to put the paper around them and shrink it. Uh, and uh, you know, they, they got to look pretty good. Aviation plants need men to design the planes of the future. I went to Virginia Tech during World War II. I was studying mechanical engineering, but I wanted to be a baseball player, not an engineer but I knew it wasn't good enough. <laughs> I thought I was gonna be this great baseball player, which I wasn't, you know, I was going nowhere. Somehow I ended off going to this junior college studying merchandising. The two years I spent there, I really didn't learn a lot, even about merchandising. I learned how to smoke cigarettes, smoke cigars, drink whiskey, and chase girls. That's what I learned. And I did a good job of learning that. And then everything changed. There is something new in the heavens. Something that has never been there before. It circles the Earth once every 96 minutes. It's called the Sputnik. I can remember Sputnik. It was in an English class. The speakers came on and the principal announced what had happened and the Russians had put a spacecraft or object into space. I remember I was driving along the road and when I heard that on the news and I thought, what? <laughs> what is this? And we said, holy moly, you know, these guys are ahead of us. Uh, they've gotten a man-made satellite. And then shortly after that, uh, when Gagarin flew. It was the propaganda coup of the year. And obviously, we all knew we were in a race. After the Russian flight, U.S. plans were accelerated. Commander Alan B. Shepard was sent into suborbital flight, unlike the Russian. And when Kennedy laid down the gauntlet, that let's go to the moon and back and do it in a decade. I can remember, I wasn't even in the space program, I said, but I remember thinking, can that be done? No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind 
or more important for the long-range exploration of space. And none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. President Kennedy had charted our course. The landing of men on the moon before the end of the decade. We did no smarts about going to the moon, about the environment we were going into, or the mechanical aspects of what was going to be required of us. These things are pretty complicated. It may not seem complicated today, but they were complicated as hell back then. The background of flight control really was what we initially did in flight tests, testing airplanes. At Edwards Air Force Base, the NACA, where I work, were responsible for the testing the X-1. And so it was almost natural to have somebody on the ground monitoring the X-1 system, making sure it was ready to fly from the bottom of the B-29. And they were able then to monitor the performance of the vehicle, but also the performance of the test pilot. That was my concept of flight test. I, that became my concept of flight control. Okay, now what does that mean in space flight to us? Do, how would we concoct that kind of a system that would allow us to get that kind of information and talk to the crew? That was a very big job. We didn't have any buildings. We didn't have any radar. We didn't have any telemetry. We didn't have any voice communication. And we ended up then saying, these are our requirements. We got to tell them it's got to have a computer. What the hell is a computer? Almost that, it was almost that much. We didn't know. It isn't something that we suddenly decided we've got a control center, we've got these stations, and so we're going to fly. That isn't how it happened. It developed with time. So it was an evolutionary thing. Chris is the creator of Mission Control. His was the very first voice that we heard, and he was the foundation for what Mission Control became and, and its relationship to the crews and the flights themselves. There was never any question who was in charge because he had the persona, he had the demeanor, he had the quickness, he had the mental skills necessary to pull this team together. He had a a way about him that he could kind of see what was happening, what was needed, and think through what we had to do to si satisfy that need. Two, one, fire. It was kind of an old steam engine kind of display. You had a bunch of little meters. For reading pressure and temperatures and quantities of fuel and things like that. When we got the goal of going to the moon, that was a really much bigger step than Mercury. So the pathway to build a control center in Houston equip it for the digital age and make it work that way was a big step for us from what we had done at the control center at the Cape. 1,500 miles west of Cape Kennedy, the heart of the entire project, the Manned Spacecraft Center at Houston, Texas. 
and this building behind me where all major decisions are made throughout the flight. Mission control. From launch to splashdown, in this room, 17 key men whose average age is only 30 will watch and control the Apollo mission. They'll be aided in their task by a continuous flow of information pouring into this room 24 hours a day from space and from tracking stations all over the world. From these display panels behind me, they'll be able to call up anything from a live television picture of Cape Kennedy or a recovery ship to moon maps, like that one, to a circuit diagram of the smallest transistor on board the spacecraft. All the controllers in this room will be helped by six rooms full of backup staff. So, we need a lot of people. We were looking for people with certain kind of capabilities, math capabilities, systems capabilities, communications capabilities, on and on. I had become an air traffic controller. One day the phone rang. It was a gentleman out here in Houston, and he started telling me they were hiring every engineer that walked in the door. And the next thing I knew, I was driving the Houston in my Austin Healey sports car with my black and white TV and my clothes. I worked at McDonnell Aircraft doing electrical design, so I got set up with an appointment and filled out an application form to work for NASA. About three months later, I come home one day and there's a telegram under my door. Job offer. <laughs> See, I thought when I applied I would just get an interview, maybe, maybe, that's what I told my wife. But when the telegram came, it was an offer. And it was an offer for more money than a country boy had ever seen. $6,770 a year. My first job was to give tours of mission control, and the control center was just being outfitted with consoles. As I was a tour guide, I had a chance to meet people that were going to man those consoles. And I say man because there were no women, they were all men. And they were going to run those consoles and make the decisions and they didn't have much time, but they had a little bit to tell me what they were going to do, at least what the basic job was of each position. This front bank of consoles, known locally as the trench, possibly because it's in the front line, is where the rocket men sit. It's their job to watch and check that every engine on board the spacecraft is firing correctly and pushing Apollo in the right direction. Right behind them here, the flight surgeon. His console has two normal screens like everybody else's, but here in the middle, on this screen, he can monitor the physical state of the astronauts second by second throughout the flight. Next door to him sits the capsule communicator. An astronaut himself, he's trained with the crew and speaks astronaut jargon, and so acts as a kind of interpreter when a particularly difficult order has to be passed from flight control to the crew. Next to him, along this pack of consoles, the men who check all the systems on the spacecraft. And behind them all, the boss, the flight director himself. He coordinates everybody's effort and uses that to assume responsibility for minute-to-minute -minute decisions on the state of the mission throughout the flight. Hey, we got a new program called Gemini. Why we got Gemini? Well, all these things we got to do to go to the moon and begin to figure it, we got to do some testing. We got to do some stuff that proves we can do this stuff. There was a side benefit 
that was very important too, and that is that the ground had to learn how to operate. Jim The moon is a necessary first step for exploration of the planets. To fly men there and return them safely in this decade is the goal of NASA's Project Apollo. The early missions of Mercury and the experience from Gemini have brought this country to the next major milestone, the first Apollo three-man space flight. These are the men to fly that mission. Command pilot Virgil Grissom. Mercury. I knew Gus Grissom extremely well. I knew Ed White pretty well. I didn't know Roger Chaffee very well at all. I knew their families. I knew their capabilities. I knew their, what drove astronauts. The Saturn rocket, the Apollo spacecraft, and all the component parts have been tested and retested. Everything is nearly ready, including the crew, for this country's first three-man space flight. On Apollo 1, we were trying to get the first man flight off, and there was push. There was obviously, and that usually happens at the beginning of a program, and we, and we were having trouble with the spacecraft, we knew that there was bad workmanship. We knew that the wires were exposed. My introduction to the Paul program after I came off of Gemini was that they were conducting a live pad test with the crew in a flight condition on the pad at the launch site in Kennedy. Most of that activity was directed by the CAPE. I mean, they were in charge of it. We were just monitoring. But the CAPE was really responsible for it. So I don't know if they felt any pressure to get that test done or not. The, you know, the way the hatch was designed, it sealed from the inside. They were buttoned up in a spacecraft. It's uh, 16 pounds per square inch of pure oxygen. I don't think any of us recognized the seriousness of the danger we had put the crew in. If you've got anything that'll burn, and if it ever catches fire, it's just going to be a holocaust. So I was sitting there watching all the data coming in, listening to the dialogue, absorbing this stuff, learning. I was back in my office doing paperwork and came back to, the, to be the flight director. And uh, Gus says, I, I'm ready to go. Finally, after bitching like hell about the fact that he couldn't hear somebody or he couldn't talk to somebody. But now we gotta get the moon. We can't talk between two or three buildings. And so we were taking a break. They were gonna see if they could fix the calm. And some of the guys stood up and went outside the room. But for some reason, I hung back for a second. I had something to do and I still had my headset on. And all once, 
You know, I heard him. Fire. And then there was some silence, and then there was a bunch of noise, just noise. I couldn't tell what it was. Wow, it all happened just right quick. We were sitting there, and we heard the crew. We heard the shouts from the crew. Egress, egress. I said, hey, get back on here. There's something going on. And uh, then from then on, it was impossible to do anything about it. Uh, of course, you just in shock. Because I've been in the flight test business quite a while in my life, I've seen death happen various ways, but not like that. And so you had that feeling of guilt. You had that feeling of remorse. You had that feeling of, my God, why did we ever let that happen? I think that uh, we kill those three men. It's almost murder. short period of time after this all happened, we were called to an all-hands meeting in the auditorium. And we were called in there by Gene Kranz. Here we had a group of very young engineers, most of them just fresh out of college, who had never gone through this type of an experience. The first thing that you do is to identify what your part in this failure was all about. And Gene commenced to tell us that we were all responsible for killing the crew. That we had not done our jobs. We could have gone to the program manager and said, look, we're not ready, but we didn't. So therefore, we will never do this again. Our teams and mission control will be known by two words. He said to us, I want you to go back to your offices and on your blackboard whiteboards that we had, I want you to write tough and competent on that board. And I don't want you to ever re remove it. Tough, we will never again shirk our responsibilities because we are forever accountable for what we do. Or in the case of Apollo 1, what we fail to do. Competent will never again take anything for granted. We will never stop learning. From now on, as a team, we will be perfect. I think it changed the entire attitude of who we were what we did, and how we progressed into the future of space flight. It's my opinion and opinion of many others had that not happened, we would never have gotten to the moon. That interim period following the fire was the only thing that saved our ass because we were able to then step back and say, what's wrong with this thing? What have to, do we have to do to fix it? And it brought together the whole organization from top to bottom in NASA. Without all of that happening, we'd have never gotten there. We had leaders actually all the way from the top that told us, you know, get the job done. And uh, they didn't try to do it for us. We worked for people that were great leaders. It started out with the Crafts and the Gilroos and those guys, and they mentored their people, and you learned to mentor your people as you became a manager. 
To be a leader, you have to be willing to accept the responsibility that requires you to do that. And that's what people don't understand about management. They don't understand that it takes a commitment that you're willing to accept. I became notorious for saying what the hell I thought. I want to hear what you have to say. And I might give you hell if I don't like it, but that's tough. Go away and come up with another idea that I might like. And I express those kind of thoughts to people. I, that's where I got my management forte. People liked it. Apollo 8 was going to be an Earth orbital flight. Uh, we were going to uh, fly the lunar module for the first time. And it would go and, and do various maneuvers in uh, Earth orbit. Well, they delivered the lunar module to the Cape and it was a horrible piece of hardware. They couldn't get the damn thing checked out. And as a result, it was way behind schedule, and it was not going to meet the schedule now of the command and service module, which was coming along very well. NASA management came up with this idea of, okay, let's take the flight opportunity that we have. Let's assume we can get the uh, fixes into the Saturn V, and uh, let us think about going around the moon. I said, my God, that's a hell of a different proposition. The risk involved there are many manifold. The first thing I did was call my people who I thought were necessary to deciding whether we could do it or not. So we all got together, there's about eight or 10 of us, talked it over and I told them what we were thinking about. I thought immediately, he's got to be crazy. I mean, you know, we're a long way from being ready to do that. And I said, I want you to go away. And I, here's what I see the problems are. Now you go away and think about this and you tell me what the problems are and whether you think you can do it. So that was a, an intense weekend. But we went back on Monday and says, uh, yes we can do it with these limitations. So we walked off from Apollo 7 after we got that all wrapped up and bang, they made that announcement. It was like, you're gonna do what? We're going to send a spacecraft out on a trajectory that's only going to miss the moon by 60 miles. It was incredible. So, if all goes well, at 10 minutes to 2 on Saturday afternoon, that's 10 minutes to 8 in the morning here, Borman, Lovell and Anders will be sitting up there one minute from launch on a mission that has more risks in it than the Americans have ever tolerated before, and on a rocket that has only flown twice.
there was a, uh, a real sense of the magnitude of what we were doing within the control center. We, we quadruple checked every number that we uh, sent up to the crew. You know, nobody said anything to each other, but you could just tell, you know, uh, by looking around. Uh, yes, uh, he's having the same thoughts that I am. This is this is no simulation. This is for real. All right, Houston. Go ahead, Houston. All right, you are go for TLI. Over. Roger, stand. We're go for TLI. Translunar injection TLI. When they did those things, you knew you were on your way. I mean, <laughs> it was no time to come back except to go around the moon and come back, you know? Now he's counting for two. It put us on a course to the moon, 25,000 miles an hour, uh, all the way, and we could actually, if we wanted to, coast all the way to the moon. Trajectory, guidance, flight dynamics, everybody in the front, what's called the front trench of this control center says they're happy. That includes the booster. During the Apollo 8 mission, I was not directly involved. So I had the luxury, and it was a luxury, of feeling the emotions that I'm sure the people in the viewing room were starting to feel. The emotions that the people out in the, in the world were watching. I mean, they were watching this crew go to the moon and basically describing it. And instead of having to stay focused on the next event, the next thing, when's the next call we got, basically I could say, God, this is beautiful. I mean, I cannot think of, of any place I'd rather be in my entire lifetime than to be here in Mission Control. Uh, this is Apollo Control Houston at uh, 68 hours, 52 minutes into the flight of Apollo 8. At this time, uh, Glenn Lunny has gone around the room uh, taking a status check uh, with his flight control team. Uh, we look go, we continue to stand by, and this is Apollo Control Houston. Here we go. I was on duty for the lunar orbit insertion, and we start falling towards the moon, and uh, it's getting bigger. There's a two-hour orbit around the moon, and when you go behind the moon, you have about maybe 50 minutes of of where you can't see the vehicle. Well, that was a very uh, eerie feeling. You know, we had, uh, here we're going to the moon, been talking back and forth with the, the flight crew all of the way, and then we have loss of signal, you know, LOS, and we can't talk to it. Mission Control said, you're going to lose communication with us at such and such a time. And to the second, that's when we lost communication. You could have heard a pin drop in that control center. I mean, if it's the first time we've gone behind the moon. You can't see it. We can't, we don't have any data. So we're depending on the spacecraft working perfectly behind the moon because it could come out from the backside of that moon. It could go anywhere. It might be headed into the damn lunar surface. It might be headed into deep space if that engine screwed up or the computer screwed up. So I'm up pretty tight.
they had to do a maneuver on the back side to slow down to stay in orbit around the moon. And if they didn't do that maneuver, they would come out uh, back into view of the Earth at one time. If they did do the maneuver, then they would come back at another time. And we had two countdown clocks set up so that we could count down to both of those. Apollo Control, Houston, mark a one minute from predicted time of acquisition. Apollo 8, Houston, over. Apollo Control, Houston, uh, Jerry Carr has uh, placed a call. We're standing by. We've heard nothing yet, but uh, we're standing by. Got it. Uh, we've got it. Apollo uh, eight now in in lunar orbit. Sure enough, they came around the corner. The burn had gone fine. They were in orbit. So there's a cheer in this room. Uh, this is Apollo Control, Houston. Uh, switching now to the voice of Jim Level. Very big sigh of relief because we knew at least they were stable now whether we could get them out of orbit that was that was another question i would say that all of us we probably spent the whole day that we were in orbit around the moon in the control center everybody was so keyed up then you know towards the end of this day frank borman comes on says you know they they have something to say approaching uh, lunar sunrise and uh, for all the people back on earth the crew of apollo 8 has a message that we would like to send to you so i was just watching what was going on with the spacecraft everything was nominal and then frank borman just started said in the beginning God created heaven and earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. It hit me like a ton of bricks. And then it hit everybody at Mission Control Center, I think, whether they were faith based or not, like a ton of bricks that made the hair stand up on my neck. It was uh, such a, I don't know, such a moment. None of us knew that was going to happen. And, uh, you know, I'm not ashamed a bit. I was cried. God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place. And it just rang the right bell for everybody. And if you thought about it for 40 years and asked yourself, well, what could you have said that was better than that, there wouldn't have been another answer. God saw that it was good. We engineers are not poets. We're not good at that. But uh, I mean, it was a profound effect on everybody that was in the control center.
A screenwriter couldn't have done a better job. The year of 1968 in the U.S., a very disastrous year with the Vietnam War going on and the elections going and the riots going, the killing of two prominent people. To end the year by going around the moon on Christmas Eve, it was all just fell into place. Fighter come drop, I can see your jets firing just to clear the bill. to work just crazy hours. We would run 10 or 12 launch sims a day. And it was grinding. We were so consumed with these flights and exercising them and so on and so on that we never really had sufficient time to savor them. It took a toll on the, on the family, you know. That we weren't around that much. The wives took over, they did all that. And, and uh, they managed the checkbooks. They did everything. If I could go back and do it all over with again, I wouldn't do it. It was that much of an impact on my family. NASA consumed my time. The simulation team had a little room right off the front of the control center with a glass window they could see us. And when we ran a simulation, which was a training exercise, it included the control center, it included the crew, the actual crew usually, over the simulator, and we were all interconnected both data and voice-wise. So it was really a way to check out all the ground systems and uh, develop procedures. Because if they didn't work in the simulator, they weren't gonna work for real. My nickname for the sim guys, those who are out to get us. <laughs> they just kept throwing problems at you all the time. And they were trying to push us to our limits and see where we would go. We were about halfway through the landing simulation. And we get this program alarm in the computer. 1201, 1202, you know, various other everybody. So you wonder what the heck is a 1201, 1202. Program alarms was the computer's way of telling us, you're asking me to do too much. They were very unfamiliar, at least to me. I called my back room, Jack Garman was an expert at uh, computer programs, and he didn't know. So I said, flight, something is happening. I don't know what, abort. In mission control, when we wrote the mission rules, you need two cues to call an abort. And that was when we started the debriefing. Simulation supervisor came in and said, well, you had one cue, what was your second one? And there was total dead silence in that room. After the debriefing was over, Gene said, I want you to get that team together and you tell me which alarms you're gonna continue on and which ones you're not. So I said, Jack, you pull together MIT, the people that built this computer and anyone else you can, come up with the list, brief me on it, and that's what we'll write as a rule. And that's exactly what Jack did. Canada's Dreaming Towers, launching pads for lofty ideals. Collins, Armstrong and Aldrin, the three men chosen for mankind's most historic mission to reach a new world and return with a handful of dust. The scientists were not very happy that we had done everything they wanted to do. 
And I had said to them, look, I'm not going to listen to any more of the things you want to do. I said, we are going to the moon. We're going to land on the moon. We're going to get our ass off of the moon as fast as we can and still pick up some samples and make sure the spacecraft's ready to go and we're coming back because we want to prove to ourselves that all the things that we thought about to fly there and back are correct and done well. And basically, I indicate that I believe we were born for this day. We were meant to be here. We did a great job preparing for this mission. And then I said, I will stand behind every decision you will make. We came into this room as a team and we will leave as a team. I can remember that today as well as if it was second ago. I, I can remember the words. I can remember what he said. And that made all the difference in the world. And then I said, uh, GC, go to battle short. And he went up and locked the control room doors. And these doors would not be reopened until we had either landed, crashed, or aborted. This is Apollo Control at 102 hours, 12 minutes into the flight of Apollo 11. We're now 2 minutes, 53 seconds from reacquiring the spacecraft. 21 minutes, 23 seconds from the beginning of the powered descent to the lunar surface. Flying control, we're at the burn attitude. Raj. Here's the Eagle, how do you read? Bye-bye, Eagle, we're standing by for your burn report, over. Here's the moon, and here's the orbit you're in. And here you do PDI, power descent initiation. And Krantz goes to every position, there you go or no go. You gotta be go or we ain't gonna start that burn. Okay, retro, go. Final, go, guide, go. Control, go. Telcom, go. Jinsei, go. Ecom, go. Surgeon, go. Capcom, or go to continue PDI. The principal challenge was, did I have enough information once we started down? And we have to update the computer's knowledge of altitude above the lunar surface. Okay, we got data back. Radar flight looks good. Raj. Good news. Landing radar catches on at 39,000 feet. 
I thought my big problem for today was over. Unfortunately, it was just starting. <laughs> Program alarm. Standing by. It's a 1202. 1202. 1202. Oh my goodness, one of those codes that we had during the sim. It was like this. The sim wasn't exactly that, but it was close. And I was frantically trying to remember which code that was. Well, when that came, I thought we were dead in the water. 12, 12.02 alarm. Yeah, and the same thing we had. Give us a reading on the 12.02 program alarm. We get the information, and it says 12.02. But I'm still trying to remember, and Jack Gorman is screaming, Steve, it's on our little list. And I'm, I just finally, I, by the time I see my list, he was about several seconds before I was. And I, it, I said, we're, we're going that flight. We're going that alarm. Roger, we got you. We're going that alarm. It's, if it doesn't reoccur, we'll be going. And that took us all of 20 seconds, maybe. But that's a lifetime in the middle of powered descent. Bales knew that it was still flying the machine and we were still going. Delta is looking good now. Roger, Delta is looking okay, good. Okay, all flight controllers hang tight. Should be throttling down pretty uh, shortly. Throttle on time. Okay, all flight controllers, gonna go for landing. Retro. Go. Fido. Go. Guidance. Go. Control. Go. Delta. Go. GNC. Go. Econ. Go. Roger, Surgeon. Copy. Go. Capcom, we're go for landing. Eagle, Houston, you're go for landing. Over. Roger, understand. Go for landing. 3,000 feet. Time alarm. 1201. 1201. Roger, 1201. Same time, we're go, flight. Okay, we're go. We're go, same time, we're go. And then, as he pitched over, there's a big boulder field down there and he can't land. 2,000 feet, into the axe, 47 degrees. Roger. There's craters in there, Three there's thousand. big Roger, boulders five. in there. Pretty rocky area. Somebody said that Armstrong thought that he just had a 50-50 chance that they'd get to land on it or have to abort it. I think he was probably the coolest hand out there uh, on that day, and uh, he had thought about this a hundred times or more in terms of uh, landing it. He had to level off, then he had to fly horizontally to get over this boulder field. Well, that took a lot of extra gas. As we kept going down, the low-level sensor tripped and said the fuel dropped below this point. Low level, low level. Now we're almost to run out of gas. Fuel critical. I started the stopwatch. We're down at one lunar G hovering, and I know how fast that uses fuel. I know, I know how many seconds are left. Eagle looking great, your go. I was giving a running uh, commentary from Mission Control, and Deke Slayton was sitting to my right. He was director of flight crew operations, and he punched me in the side and said, shut up, Charlie, let them land. <laughs> I think we better be quiet. Right. 400 feet down at nine. Okay, the only call-outs from now on will be fuel. Stay forward. Okay, Bob, I'll be standing Bob, by for your call-out shortly. On my stopwatch, I put a little piece of scotch tape and I said, okay, at this point now, we'll have 60 seconds left. A little, little further, we've got 30 seconds left. And a little further, we got zero. We were set up so that the astronaut knew when you reach the point, either he's going to land or he's going to abort. I'm convinced that within 100 feet of the moon, and I'd have called an abort, he would have continued his descent. Hey, 75 feet. That's looking About good. 60. Down a half. Roger. 60. Forward. 60 seconds. 60 seconds. Now that control room got quiet. It just felt like everybody was just glued to their consoles and holding their breath. The last uh, 10 or 12 seconds of that landing was very tense. You know, are we going to do this or not? Down two and a half. And I was looking at the altitude, and I thought, we're not going to make it. There's no way. There's too much altitude for us to drop. What I didn't know, we were in a crater. And when they come up to the lip of the crater, you know, they come along here, and I'm showing this much altitude. When they come over on the plateau, bam, it did a step jump. Forward, forward. And shortly after that, uh, 
bus said, I see dust. Oh, it was, it was a sigh of relief. Three feet down, two and a half. Picking up the bus. Three feet, two and a half down. Break shadow. And half a third. Four forward. Four forward, drifting to the right a little. 30. 30. Down and a half. 30 seconds. Forward. Good. Hey. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. APA at a descent. We've had shut down. We landed with 18 seconds left on the stopwatch. We copy you down, Eagle. Okay, everybody, T1, stand by for T1. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twain. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. Thank you. You're looking good here. Okay, we're going to be busy for a minute. Then it finally dawned on us, you know, we just landed on the moon. It, we're not talking about landing on a, in an airport or something here. We're talking about landing on the moon. Okay, keep the chatter down in this room. Roger. Everybody's applauding behind us the control room, but we gotta stay totally focused. Or is it safe to remain here for the next two minutes? Yes or no? Is the spacecraft going to tip over, fall over? Are we in a crater or a sliding down? So we had a variety of questions we had to answer. Okay, T1, stay no stay, retro. Stay, right on, stay, right, stay. I remember uh, Kranz went around, stay no stay. Of course, you couldn't say go no go. You had to say stay no stay. And so we said stay, everybody said stay. Right after this, the final stay no stay, somebody grabs me by the shoulders. And I looked up and I said, oh my God. <laughs> That's all. Yeah, I said, Chris Crafted was also in charge of the software of the computer software uh, managing it uh, before the uh, first Apollo flights. And so he it knew what could have happened. He knew the rules pretty well. And uh, yeah, that was, really, uh, that was really quite a thing. To finally get there and to be down there, it's the first time you know, in the history of the human race that anybody has done something like that. And it's like the team delivered this. It was impressive. This was the ultimate, ultimate, ultimate testing of the teams and mission control and the culture that was established there. And eventually we did a shift change. And I stopped to get something to eat, some breakfast. And as I walked in, I bought a newspaper. Well, that newspaper is about three inches thick. I still happen to have that newspaper, by the way. And um, I sat down at the counter and I ordered my scrambled eggs and I'm drinking my coffee and I'm looking at all of this. We landed on the moon and all the things. And two guys walked in and sat down next to me. And one of them said to the other one, he said, you know, I landed in Normandy on D-Day, and I'm listening. And then he said, I was never prouder to be an American than yesterday when we landed on the moon. It then hit me what we had done. Here, men from the planet Earth, first set foot upon the moon. It came in peace for all mankind, July 1969, AP.
has been selected tonight to receive this Group Achievement Award for the whole 400,000 who, in one way or another, have contributed to the success of this program is a young man. Steve Bales, when the computers seemed to be confused and we, when he could have said stop or when he could have said wait, said go. Apollo 12. Started off just like any other mission. A countdown for Apollo 12 still going at this time. Project officials are still keeping a close eye on this weather front that has moved into the area more rapidly than anticipated earlier this morning. The weather front I got a flight awareness award. So I got to go down and watch the launch. T minus 20. I'm sitting out there in the rain, three miles we away. Back. We have guidance internal. Ten, nine, eight, ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engines running, permit liftoff. We have liftoff, 11.22 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. That Saturn V is a powerful vehicle. And when, once one lights off, you can feel your clothes pulsating. Tower clear. Engine a roll program, and this baby is really going. I'm feeling pretty spunky. You know, here's my first time as a lead flight director or a launch flight director. Even. Pete Conrad reporting the roll on pitch program to put Apollo 12 on the proper course. 30 or so seconds into the flight. Roll complete. Roger, Pete. I see two streaks of lightning down each side of the vehicle. Wow, the crew came alive. Okay, we just lost the platform, gang. I don't know what happened here. We had everything in the world drop out. All the data went blank. My old but with console lights, I mean, just lit up like a Christmas tree. And I watched John. John just stood there, and I don't remember him talking to the back room. I got three fuel cell lights, an AC bus light, a fuel cell system, AC bus overload, one and two, main bus A and B out. The thought that I had first is I'm going to be the first guy that has to call on the board. I, got I looked at my data. And he just stared at the data and stared at the data. Maybe just the indicator. What do you I said, John, I, I said, you talk to the back room. And John ignored me. And all of a sudden, there was uh, some patterns and stuff on the screen. I wasn't too sure at first what they were, but then, then I said, you know, I thought to myself, I've seen this. Bang, I've seen this before. And it turned out that he had seen what the data would look like by, from a ground test, which he remembered. And that's when it clicked. The stickle conditioning equipment, SCE. Is that the SCE? Well, I don't know, John. It's sure what do you see? I'm lost. Somebody comes by SCE to off. And then John Aaron said, flight, tell him to go SCE to AUX. SCE to AUX. Auxiliary flight. SCE to AUX, Capcom. And uh, Jerry Carr said, what? <laughs> what is that? John came in on top of both of us and said, signal conditioning equipment to auxiliary. He went to the spacecraft. Clock 12, Houston, try SCE to auxiliary. Try SCE to auxiliary. What the hell is that? Still self Al Bean knew where the switch was. He reached down and he flipped it. As soon as he did, voila, we had it all back. We got it back, boy. It looks good. Okay. Now, it's not the SCE to AUX fixed the problem. SCE to AUX was the thing that allowed me to get the data back. But the one thing I kept looking at was the trajectory plot, uh, which we had on a big display in the front. It was right on. Staging. Now we're beating out our problems here. I don't know what happened. Uh, I'm not sure we can get hit by lightning. And that's when I told Jerry, I said, look, don't put yourself under but so much pressure. We don't have to go to the moon today. We can just do some tests in Earth orbit and we'll come home and go the next time. And all he was really saying is, your call, you know. I said, well, it's your job. You know, that's what you guys know better than I do how to do this. 
I just want you to know that you don't have to be under the hammer or the, the pressure of making a bad decision. And so you make a good one. That's, and I'll accept it. Well, we kept checking things out, and sure enough, uh, it was okay. So we, let's go for TLI. So here we went. And you know, the mission after that was one of the cleanest we ever had. Down to the, the pit. <laughs> and that may have been a small one for Neil, but that's a long one for me. And we had a hell of a party. I got to the control center and I was due to go on shift an hour later. Uh, everything seemed to be going fine. This is the crew of Apollo 13. We wish everybody there a nice evening and uh, we're just about ready to close out our inspection of Aquarius and get back to a pleasant evening at the Odyssey. Good night. Thank you, 13. Normally, the last hour of the eight hour shift we would prepare the crew for their sleep period. And there are certain things that we had in the checklist that had to be done. One of the items was stir to cryos, oxygen and hydrogen. ECS economy. Go economy. You getting your stir now on the O2? So we've stirred to cryos. And all hell broke loose. Okay, uh, What's the matter with the data you got? Okay. We've got more on a problem. Okay, listen, listen, you guys. We've lost uh, fuel cell one and two pressure. We lost uh, O2 tank two pressure. And temperature. Oh, uh, you're coming without a problem. Okay. Stand by, they got a problem. Well, basically, I had a whole bunch of problems reported to me. I was wondering which one he was talking about. We had a pretty large bang associated with the uh, caution and warning there. Okay, stand by, 13. We're looking at it. I came in and plugged it back in, sat down next to Gene. The first reaction is, well, look, maybe we're having an electrical problem here, and it affects the te telemetry and the instrumentation. You see an AC bus undervolt there, you come? Negative flight. We may have had an instrumentation problem flight. Roger. I said, I think we've had an instrumentation problem flight, and that was probably the, the biggest under statement in the history of manned space flight. I mean, I couldn't have been more wrong. <laughs> well, let's get some recommendation here, Si, if you got any better ideas. Actually, I got uh, a little panicky. <laughs> you know, when you, when you begin to panic, this gorge comes up in your throat where you get to a point of fight or flight, and a fleeting thought of getting up and going home did pass my mind, and of course, that was not an option, and I knew that. Can we review our status here, Cy, and see what we've got from a standpoint of status? What do you think we got in a spacecraft that's good? Stand by, fine. So, uh, and then when I got settled down, I said, you know, it, it, it does appear we've actually lost two fuel cells, and I really don't know why. We didn't know what happened. 
It wasn't until I looked out the window that I realized how serious we were. I looked at me looking out the uh, hatch that we are venting something. We are, uh, we are venting something out uh, into space. When I saw that oxygen being expelled, I realized it was not just the oxygen, but the electrical power and the propulsion system. Roger, we copy your venting. It's beginning to dawn on the control center that maybe this is a real problem that we got here and uh, uh, it's not going to go away. Uh, flight, we're going to hit 100 PSI in uh, an hour and 54 minutes. That's the end right there. And that is where basically my frame of mind changed to survival mode. I call my controller and say, okay, I'll flight controller, settle down, quit your guess, and let's start work on this problem. Okay, now let's everybody keep cool. Let's make sure that we don't do anything that's going to blow our electrical power with the batteries or that will cause us to lose fuel cell number two. We got the command module system, so we're in good shape if we need to get home. Let's solve the problem, but let's not make it any worse by guessing. Here is a bulletin from ABC News. The Apollo 13 spacecraft has had a serious power supply malfunction that could cause the lunar landing mission to be terminated early. As soon as we heard it, you know, we, we all came in to do what we could to help out. People came from everywhere all across the country. When I got there, uh, of course, I went to the back room. It was a chaos. They were still trying to recover their sanity from what had happened, and they were beginning to regroup. And I didn't even initially put on a headset. I just walked behind the consoles and, and listened to them over the voiceways what problem they were working. That damn room was in serious confusion. And it, it took me a while to come to that conclusion, but it was true. Failure was for quite a while during that period of time. May not have been an option, but it was out there lurking uh, in, in a dark sky. It, it was just, it was just almost daring us to make a mistake. Okay, 13, this is Houston. It appears to us that we're uh, losing O2 flow through uh, fuel cell three. They were slowly losing electrical power, and it was, wasn't going to be long until all the fuel cells were offline, so now we're on entry battery. I walked up and sat down next to the ECOM, Cy Liebergut, he was on, and I said, Cy, this problem, you're not going to fix this one. So I said, you got to shut the command module down. And you can imagine the reluctance to do that. Flight Econ. Go ahead, Econ. The pressure in O2 tank one is all the way down to 297. You better think about getting in the LEM or using the LEM systems.
hours from home, and uh, we have a plan for carrying out the rest of the mission, but uh, uh, there's going to be no relaxation at all as far as that goes from now until splash. I did not appreciate how much reaction we were getting from the outside world. It didn't sink on me till later how connected everybody seemed to feel with these three guys. Uh, you know, they didn't even know them and didn't know their names or anything, but, but the whole world seemed to be united and pulling for this to come off well. The situation is extremely critical and we're monitoring it at all times. We'll be back with another report at 12.30 and then you can see a full analysis of what's happening at one o'clock. We all smoked. And when I say smoked, we really smoked. When you went into the control room, you came in that side door and when you opened that door, a cloud of smoke came out the door. That's how much smoke there was. Apollo 13 brought out some big, very interesting things because it wasn't like you got cleaned up and dressed to come to work and put on your shirt and tie and brushed your teeth and used your underarm deodorant. You went running, right? We were there for 35 hours straight. I think I wore the same set of clothes for at least three or four or five days. I slept in his the earth starting to get bigger and bigger and I realized that we had to have instructions of the best way to power up the command module and so I kept asking very politely at the time uh, do you have those instructions and they said we're working on it we're working on it the original power up document started off with John Aaron and I on a on a blackboard we kind of drew some things on the board and some rough ideas. That was the beginning of the document. I knew basically what equipment you had to have on to do a certain function. That then started the whole process of how to build all the detail switches and circuit breakers, what sequence you had to do this in. And it was all very compressed. From there, it just started growing and, and people would start inputting their piece of their, their, their t turf, their territory. And uh, one organization wanted this. Well, that had to come back into the document and actually through John and I to say, hey, can we afford to do that power-wise? And we worked out all the bugs, all the procedures, and the final document was, of course, then proved and read to the crew. Tomorrow morning, Eastern time, the spacecraft will approach the Earth looking like this. This is the way it looks now. About five hours before it reaches the Earth's atmosphere, the men in the command module will jettison this part here called the command, the service module, and it'll float away in space. That will leave these two parts of the spacecraft, the LEM here, and the command module here. And there's one whole side of that spacecraft missing. Right by the high gate antenna, the whole panel is blown out, almost from the uh, base to the uh, engine. 
copy that. It's really a mess. I don't remember saying, hey, man, we've done it, because we hadn't yet, okay? There were still so many variables involved that, you know, I was just hoping what we did was right. We didn't know whether the explosion that we now knew had occurred, what the entire effect was on the command module. We don't know whether the heat shield's been damaged or what, and is everything we have done to save the crew going to work? I know all of us here want to thank uh, all you guys down there for the very fine job you did. That's the firm, Joe. I tell you, we all had a good time doing it. the returning flights, we have what we call blackout. Uh, there's a period where they black out and because of ionization, the heat. And you couldn't communicate through it, so they couldn't talk to you and you couldn't talk to them. At this stage in the space program, we could compute one Blackout will start, and when it will end within a second, and we've never missed. Well, in this case, it started right on time, and then when the time came to come out, uh, it didn't happen. Okay, Jimmy. Jimmy coming out of blackout now. Can you see him? You know, I started thinking, oh, my God, you know, here we've done all of these things to get him back home, and uh, uh, something's happened to the heat shield. The thoughts going through my mind at that time is they're gone. There were concerns relative to the management chain there buzzing around that we might have damaged heat shield or all that kind of stuff. And that's to the point where I just, and I think this is true of every controller, you put out of your mind those things you have no control over. Don't worry about them. That's the breaks of the game. If that's it, so be it. Work on our contact yet? Not in the staff line. You've got communications with your eye. That's the problem. So we sat there, and we sat there, and we sat there, and I forget how long it actually was late. Capcom, why don't you try and give him a call? these three big old balloon shoots. You know, most beautiful.
ignition. Fly away, Houston. After the Apollo 1 fire, tough and competent became the mantra of the flight control team. Those are still the core of the principles and the foundations that we, that we live by. Uh, I don't think that has diminished at all. Guys, you can start opening your cup checklist to page seven. We are in a terminate case. Our key priorities are always crew safety, vehicle safety, mission success, uh, and those don't alter. But what mission success means changes over time. Those folks that, that flew the early missions, they set the standard. They, they went through the fire uh, for us. Um, and we try, to, we try to live up to uh, the, the excellence that they demonstrated every day. It's amazing. I, I think it's amazing that we were not only able to do it technically, but the country let us do it. The public and the Congress and the leadership and the White House, everything collided and lined up correctly. I had the feeling of, of what it meant. You know, we're making history. I think all of us did. And realizing that, there was a sense of pride in what we're doing. And a great feeling of gratitude that I happened to stumble into it at the right time. It was just a golden opportunity to, to be a part of it. Somehow or other, when we came together, we were greater than the sum of our parts we became capable of doing what in most cases would be considered impossible. We were better than we ever expected to be. We are more successful than we are expected to be. And really with the exception of a bad accident in the launch pad, we brought every crewman home. We, the astronauts, we were always the tip of the arrow. But mission control, were sort of like the feathers. They pointed us in a...